we want to keep this conversational. Yeah, it's not going to be like a lecture. It's going to be more of a um, conversation, lots of um, Q&A and stuff like that. So I guess we'll start with how we met. Um, some of you know the story, some of you don't, but. Yeah, there's, uh, I'm not going to say any names, but uh, Jason Berg, uh, he's a member at this gym. He, he came in one day, I was working out, and he says, uh, hey, John, do you like white girls? And I was like, dude, it's 2018. I like, um, you know, uh, I don't just like white girls. What are you talking about? And he says, I have, um, I have a therapist I want to set you up with. And I said, listen, I don't just date therapists. Anyway, they were old friends, and uh, I'll, let you, I'll let you tell them um, the short version, of, the the short version of, of, of how we met, because it's kind of funny. So I always say I manifested John when people ask me, um, only because my best friend, Danae, who's standing in the back, actually, uh, Danae had been a follower of John's <laughs> for a long time, and you know, had sent me stuff, and I don't remember what it was, but for some reason, something he had posted, I was like, oh. And I remember in that moment being like, Huh, and I wish I remember what it was, but I kind of just started doing my Instagram stalking, as you do. And I sent her the post and I was like, I find this guy to be incredibly attractive. He seems to be single, he lives in LA, and we have a mutual friend. I'm gonna date this guy. And she was like, okay. <laughs> like, I don't know, at the time he had like 50,000 followers. She's like, okay. And I was like, no, I'm serious, I'm gonna date him. Like, I just had this weird knowing. I was like, I'm gonna date this guy. And so I had already had something on the books to hang out with our mutual friend. And so we're hiking and we're chatting. And my whole intention was to be like, hey, you know, hook it up. Never said a word. And all of a sudden his friend um, out of nowhere goes, I have this guy that I feel like you'd really get along with. And I was like, oh. And he's like, yeah, you know, he's on Instagram as anger therapist. And I was like, oh, I don't think I know him. And, <laughs> and totally pretty cool. And uh, lo and behold, he, he played Cupid. And uh, John texted me and actually set up like, dinner plans like hi nice to meet you let's go to dinner he made reservations and coming from new york i don't know if it's the same in la because i didn't date very much in la but in new york it's like coffee drinks like you know let's do this as quickly as possible so i can like see if this is worth my time you know and he actually set up a legit dinner and i was very impressed and so here yeah we i was trying to check out her ass and she was wearing something around her butt yeah, i was wearing a long sweater and i couldn't i couldn't see her butt and i kept going <laughs> like oh shit her sister's here um, <laughs> but the conversation was good, and I was just coming off the heels of being um, single on purpose, and I've been in relationships for most of my life, and so I had a lot of um, reservations. I didn't want to jump into anything because I thought the next thing's going to be the big one, right? So I was very in and out and ambivalent. Um, I wasn't done. I felt like I wasn't done being single, and I wanted to do all the things that... Uh, you know, um, I missed out on on my 20s. I wanted to wake up with someone that I didn't like. I wanted to, to do drugs and, and have crazy sex and do all these things. Um, and I didn't get far. And uh, so that was a lot of our beginning where um, I was confusing to her. And um, I love you, get away, and all that. And so that's just, it, that's how it started. And uh, yeah, it wasn't. Um, wasn't picture perfect. Yeah, it was rocky. It was rocky, and there was a lot of back and forth. And so, I think that's a really good segue maybe into the conversation around the one. Because yes. I feel like that was part of your ambivalence, right? Yeah. You know, we grow up with um, this idea of the one, um, partly because of um, Disney movies and uh, um, programming, and it puts a lot of pressure on on ourselves to find like the perfect person. And I'm also guilty of falling into that. And so when I met Vanessa, you know, I pulled out my checklist and I'm like, you know, does our humor match, does this? And I put her under a uh, microscope. And because we were different and some things didn't line up, um, I didn't think she was quote unquote the one. And uh, four years later, I have changed my definition of the one. I don't believe in the one anymore. I think it's damaging. Um, I think the one is the one that's in front of you. You know, and, and that's it. And if that doesn't work out, then the one is the one that's in front of you next, you know, and it keeps you present and focused and not, uh, it, it makes you kind of um, put the checklist away, you know. Yeah, you have this quote that you, you wrote this part in the book, and I'm probably going to butcher it exactly, but it, it's basically like the one is it's who you choose to love in right. the moment, right? It's who you choose to love every day. Um, and once you stop choosing to love somebody, then they're no longer the one, right? I think to your point, we have this idea, and, and look, this isn't to take away, 
we all want the fairy tale and the butterflies, and we'll we'll talk about chemistry a little bit too, because um, we have a little bit of a theory on that too. But um, I don't. I can speak for myself when I can say I had that one. I had that like, oh my god, the literally the world shifted underneath my feet, um, you know, and it was like I. It was physically painful for me to not be in the same room with this person. Like it was that kind of love, and you know that it didn't. It wasn't a long-lasting love. It was. It was a flash in the pan, and it was intense, and it was long. I mean, we had a long relationship, but um, it wasn't a daily choice, and it wasn't a choice, a committed choice that we both made every day, where we showed up over and over and over again. And so I think that's really changed our definition. Yeah, you know what's interesting is just hearing her say that that there was a guy before me that she couldn't, you know, breathe without makes me feel, um, it makes me feel that that, what she had with that person is more and better than what she had with me, yeah, that's which is residue of this belief of yeah. the one. And so as she's saying that, I'm feeling, oh, is she even attracted to me? Maybe she should be with that guy, you know, that kind of stuff. And it's coming from the, the, this damaging thing of, um, of the one, yeah. right? And I think it damages our relationships for sure. So the lightning in the bottle. Um, what do you guys think of this idea of attraction? We wanted to reframe what attraction looks like. Um, a lot of people believe that uh, you lock eyes across the room and um, you know when you know. You know you hear that a lot. Um, and I don't want to take away from anyone's truth, but um, I have learned that this is just my opinion that um, lightning the lightning may actually be dysfunction and so what you're attracted to the animalistic attraction um, i worked in addiction for many years and there's this um it's like uh it's like the tommy lee pamela anderson thing that they have that is uh, uh you take someone who is a um, addict or a predator i don't mean predator like dateline but there's addiction <laughs> there's addiction in your blood like my dad was an alcoholic right so I have that, and a lot of people mistake that for the bad boy, impulsive, reckless, unpredictable, which equals exciting. And then you take someone who may fall under the category of prey, which is someone was taken from her, um, maybe her voice, maybe her virginity, or something was taken from her at an early age. Maybe she's the caretaker. Maybe she's a care. Maybe she grew up too fast. Maybe she wants um, to take care of somebody, fix somebody, save somebody. Yeah, or maybe dad had an iron fist, or you know whatever it is. And you put two, those two people in the room as adults, and. They just find each other. And I think that, and that's why there's Alon meetings and, and all that, but I think that can be mistaken for um, the lightning. And then we're like, oh, I can't be without this person. And we, we um, put that on a pedestal with, um, you know, the fairy tale of happily ever after and love, and this is the one. And we don't realize that it's, uh, it's dysfunction. Well, and also, you know, to take it even out of like the the kind of Al-Anon AA world, I mean, you know, there's this thing called repetition compulsion, right? It's a Freudian term, and really it's this idea that unconsciously we will continue to repeat the same patterns over and over and over again until it clicks, right? Which usually doesn't click, but our ego thinks it will eventually, right? If we just keep doing it over and over again. and so. It's an attempt for us to master something. It's an attempt for us to get it right this time. It's an attempt to understand it. And so this is why you'll, you know, especially as therapists, we get this all the time. I just keep dating the same person. I keep finding myself in the same situation over and over again, right? And so even that type of attraction where it's like, oh, I'm, there's something about this person. Again, we're not saying all the time. Obviously, there's always that time when that's not the case. But a lot of times, many times we see it, it's this very kind of, it smells like home, you know? Um, there's a lot of familiarity of what love felt like, looked like, smelled like when you were growing up. And then, and now we're kind of playing out those same, you know, historical patterns. Who wants to share, who can relate to this? Who wants to share a quick story about, about that, lighting in the bottle? Yeah. This is the one that really resonated with me because that was a pattern that I repeated slightly different. So I kept saying, I don't have a pattern. Yeah. <laughs> and in my last relationship, it was the first time I realized, oh no, you do. And very much like you said, Vanessa, I was the oldest child. Mm -hmm. I took care of my under, my younger sister. I was like a 40 year old when I was seven years old. Same girl, same. And so I ended up finding myself with taking care of people. Mm -hmm. And my last relationship was with the nicest guy, but an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And just like you said, it's like all these things resonate. 
you know, you keep thinking you can fix it. So we would break up. He'd come back. No, no, I'm going to do this. Okay, this time it's going to work. This time it's yep. going to work. And it was that lightning in a bottle when we met. It was like, if there's this much chemistry, I can't be away from them. It's got to be the right one. Yeah. So I, I appreciate, like, you guys brought everything together. And I just want you to know that after reading, I got the, it's not me, it's you. I did end the relationship. Mm -hmm. And it's, like, completely end of story. All those pieces came together for me. So oh. I'm so Grateful to get to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hey, we have seats up here. If you want to, um, Millie. Nobody wants to sit in the front. There's two, the, yeah, <laughs> and also, uh, we can grab some. It's super well, it's intimate. Like college. Everybody's like, I'm going to sit in the back. We, we don't want you to be standing. Um, <laughs> be brave. And there's ben there's benches as well. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, please. Just to share off, like my, my, it was my teenage daughter who kind of got out and, showed, and told me, um, you're in this relationship because it's comfortable. Oof. Yeah. That's hard to hear from your uh, kid. But, <laughs> And yeah. I was like, that's not true. Wait, how old is your kid? She, at the time, she was 16. She's wow. not That's hard to hear. Yeah. 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 So, and, and I really had to like, be more self aware. Like, well, is that the case? Am I mm. comfortable? And, and then I, I admit it. I'm like, you're absolutely right. Yeah. It is comfortable. It is comfortable for me. And she's like, but that doesn't mean it's right. Yes. <laughs> So I'm going to piggyback on what you're saying, and I'm going to, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. But I, I talk a little bit about this idea of being chosen in the book. And so my last relationship before John, well, my last long relationship before John, um, I knew that he would never leave. I knew without a shadow of a doubt he would never leave. Physically, he would never leave. Um, emotionally and mentally, that's a different story. Also an alcoholic. You know, we struggle with our, our, a lot of stuff. Um, but there was this, this pull that I had, this comfort that I had in knowing that he would never go anywhere, right? And I realized that that was also a pattern of mine, was finding these people who, whether they were projects, whether they needed me, but if they needed me, then I knew that they wouldn't leave, right? Um, and so I talk about how being chosen was really my, that's what lightning in a bottle meant to me. It was this instant feeling of this person. I mean, all of my relationships, it was like this immediate kind of like, two weeks in, I'm in love with you, you're amazing, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And my ego would be like, I know, it's great, you know? I'm so <laughs> wonderful. But, but then realizing, right, what that really was. It was this um, very codependent, kind of um, enmeshed, very dysfunctional kind of dynamic. And um, I'm gonna read that little part. But yeah, um, and so I'm very, I, I, I'll leave after the seminar. No, I'm just kidding. Um, because of my ambivalence and because she didn't feel from me that I chose her, mm -hmm. uh, the magnet flipped. And yep. so the first year of our relationship, it was very rocky. Um, so with her, I didn't feel the lightning. And as I say that, I feel guilty because I don't want her to think that it's not that I'm not attracted to her. Um, of course, she's beautiful and I was very attracted to her, but I didn't feel the, the thing that I did when I was in my 20s and uh, the thing that, you know, knocked my knee-high socks off and made me lose myself. And I think because we're both at a place where we, we uh, swam past that. And so what we're left with is not dysfunction, but um, neutral soil. What we're left with is something healthy and healthy um, sometimes is boring. Yeah, you know? it can be for sure. It's and that's system. what's hard. Yeah, and, and, and I think... Uh, for many people, and we'll kind of get into it later, yeah, uh, you can read that, yeah. but um, the work is actually leaning into what might feel boring. Yeah. Agreed. So I'm gonna read this little part. I read it in our book club, so if you, you've, you've heard it before if you're in our book clubs on Mondays, but. Um, okay, so I say, <clears throat> even though we finished off the Costa Rica trip at a small romantic hotel with some good food and hot sex, I wasn't fully present. I had so much brewing inside me that would carry over into the next few weeks of our relationship. When we got back to Los Angeles, I made a decision. I was going to break relationship patterns that no longer served me. I was no longer going to base my self-worth on whether or not the other person in the relationship, romantic or otherwise, was choosing me. I had spent my life contorting who I really was in order to be chosen, telling myself, don't rock the boat, say the right thing, don't say the wrong thing, be the cool girl who's not too needy, don't have any needs, period. Be sexual and make them want you, but not so sexual that they only want that. Be funny, but don't talk too much. Don't be too much. Always be on. Like what they like. Give, 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 but don't take. I was exhausted. I decided during that trip that it didn't matter who chose me if I didn't choose me. 
I wanted to be able to be myself, fully authentic in this relationship and in any relationships moving forward. But that was entirely on me. Maybe my knowing with John wasn't about him being my person. Maybe it was about the importance of him coming into my life so I could finally face myself and decide I was worth choosing. So when we got back from our Costa Rica trip, which we talk about in here, um, I was done. It was a, we were four months in and it was, I think we were two or three of these cycles in of him pushing, pulling, pushing, pulling. And I just said, I need a week. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to hear from you. I don't want to see you. I need, I need some time. And I had really decided, I mean, when we came back together, I basically, to use what my mom would say, I basically told him, shit or get off the pot, right? Like I was like, you're either in this or you're not, but I don't feel safe in this dance that we're doing, right? I can't emotionally open up. I can't be vulnerable. I can't any of this when I constantly am like, are you in it? Are you not in it? Do you like me? Do you, you know, where are you at? Um, and so that for me was a real aha moment because I don't think I would have done that two relationships ago, three relationships, you know, in my 20s, whatever you want to say. Um, but it really was a, a real revelation for me that there was an opportunity in this to say, I choose me. Like, I know I'm fucking awesome. And it's not that I want you to have that again, that like, oh my God, I love you. You're so amazing, which I was getting before. I wanted it to be genuine. And so I needed to choose me to, to get that. Is kind of what I, I realized. And her friends um, who were saying, oh, yeah, you're gonna, you manifested this guy is now saying, fuck this guy. <laughs> First in it. First in it. Let him go. He's, um, he's a hypocrite. He's trash. Um, and he's a little short. No. Um, so I was going to say something. Wait, what? what, what? Yeah, I lost it because I was trying to be funny. <laughs> uh, what, were, what were you saying? We're talking about being chosen. Being chosen. So I think the universe um, uh, put, puts tests in front of us. And so the test that the universe put in front of Vanessa through me yeah. was, um, okay, here's a guy. He's not going to choose you. You're used to being chosen. He, in, in, uh, chosen. He's not going to choose you. So you could either um, choose yourself or, you, or, or, or not. And so she chose herself, and I think that was a huge chapter. Um, it was a kind of an act break in your story, no? Yeah, it was. It yeah. was. And I, I do believe there was something in that that woke you up. Like me choosing me, me yeah. not chasing you, and me basically just saying, you, I'm good either way. Like, you make this choice. I think well, it told yeah. It basically said, okay, she's not going to be there forever. So you got to decide: are you all in or not? You know. And, and that so. was an interesting dynamic that we had too, because we're talking about my history of of needing to be needed and being the caretaker. And in a lot of ways, when John and I first met, we had talked about his previous relationships being women who actually needed him, like needed to be needing to be saved in a lot of ways. And so there was a rub on that too, because I remember very early in the relationship, me saying to you, like, I don't, I don't need you to save me. Like, I've done a lot of work and I'm in a really good place and um, I don't need that role from you. So I do think there was a little bit of, who are we in this relationship? I think it was going on for both of us. And I do think that I've talked to a lot of clients who have come to that, um, let's place a, we'll say the place of boredom, like we were talking about. And so many times the question that we're able to get to underneath it is, but I don't know who I am in this relationship. Like it feels different, which doesn't feel comfortable to me, right? It doesn't feel activating. It doesn't feel exciting. It doesn't feel, but a lot of times there's this like, I don't know what my role is because I know who I am. I know what my role is. If I'm the caretaker, I know that. But when you meet that person that challenges that role, a lot of times your ego is going to be like, oh, this clearly isn't it. This isn't the right one, right? And so I would say, if you ever come to that place, or if you are in the place, whether you're in a relationship or not, where you're like, I don't know who I am in this relationship, what's my role, question where that's coming from. Yeah, and you know what's interesting is uh, if the relationship forces you to not wear hats yes. and uh, you don't have a role, then it also forces you to show yourself. And that could be scary, right? So if you took on a role in other relationships, like you were the caretaker, or you were the person that um, your partner put on a pedestal, whatever the role is, yeah. if that's now gone, who are you? And that is going to force you to really show yourself. Mm -hmm. And so, again, that's work, you yeah. know, and that's hard. And, and that's why I think healthy relationships are really hard to, hard to build. Agreed. All right. Can anyone relate? Wait, can anyone relate to um, 
what we're talking about. I also want to put a little thing out there to, to get some thinking going too. So I want to ask some questions around this. Well, uh, well real quick, um, what does it look like for you to choose yourself? I think. Well, that's, yeah. Okay, that's a question. <laughs> You've memorized it. Where in your life, or where in your life have you, are you acting, performing, or phoning it in in order to be chosen? What does that look like in your behavior? Are you open and honest with yourself and others regardless of the possibility that they may not like it or they could walk away? And then we go, we go deeper into like, what does that feel like in your body? You know, and a little bit more like actual practices. But I think those are some really good questions to ask yourself, right? Like where in your life, because I would say everybody has had an experience of doing something that didn't feel authentic or saying something or not saying something, right? In order to be quote unquote chosen. Um, and what does that look like? for you what does let me ask you what does chosen being chosen look like for you because it doesn't stop once you start loving someone right so what, what does that look like for you today with me um, I still struggle with not speaking up communicating needs not rocking the boat right. um, I still struggle with that that talk track of like it's not worth it that's a big one for me um, it's not worth it it's not a big deal so I would say that is one of them that still looks like, I, I'm not gonna speak up because if I don't speak up, you're still gonna choose me, right? But if I speak up and we fight about this or we, you know, who knows where that could go. Um, so there's still a little bit of that manipulation, that control of relationship that I'm doing by not being honest, by not being authentic and showing up. Yeah. Um, I think for me, when I think about um, being chosen, I don't know if this is healthy or not, but I, I translate it into um, feeling desired and it starts to bleed into um, sex and bedroom stuff and so just being aware that that's my pattern I think is what's important um, like if there's not enough you mean yeah or like if I'm used to uh, relationships where um, they thought I hung the moon or you know my love language because I'm a writer words love notes come home you know, and they jump on me like that. So Vanessa's def not that, right? And so, um, I, <laughs> which, 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 <laughs> it's like she well, no, okay, yeah, she's not. Um, <laughs> not letting that be my definition of being chosen. Because mm -hmm. when I come home, she's definitely not going to run and jump on me, right? Um, and this maybe leads to um, beauty in the contrast. You know? you're chosen. Anybody yeah. have any thoughts on this idea of being chosen? Or what your definition is? Yeah, I think it's interesting. I grew up in a very Protestant Christian household mm. and into adulthood, you know, kind of putting that aside. You know, I was brought up and taught to serve others. Mm. You know, my life is a huge point. My life is a huge sacrifice. And so that bled over to my relationship. Yeah. You know, the last girl I, I said, I love you, was like two years ago, and she was an alcoholic. You know, she mm -hmm. was struggling with that. Uh, and not to, you know, make lighter or, you know, change anybody's truth or anything like that, but the reason I said I love you is because I was feeling that I was serving her. Yes. And so only finding that I, you know, went on that date a few weeks ago, and I remember texting a friend that there's nothing more that I like than going home after the date feeling like my dog because I feel chosen. Ah. I said, I don't want that relationship. Yeah. And so I said, I haven't really met anybody where I feel as chosen as I do every time I call her. Dog, <laughs> Unconditional. And so, you know, I, I think I'm still discovering it day to day, yeah. you know, and stuff like that. But it was interesting talking to my therapist about a week ago about this and just a job decision that I made. And I felt guilty about that, about yes. saying no to somebody. Yes. Uh, but realizing that I've been an obligement, you yes. know, uh, because I'm getting, because of my upbringing, I feel this satisfaction, I feel this worth in serving others. Yep. And then I'm feeling guilty about choosing myself. Choosing yourself? And so, you know, not really necessarily answer your question, but just more my personal opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just something I'm constantly discovering of even something simple as just choosing myself and uh, not feeling guilty about it. You're, you're putting words, though, to something that has become a bit of a, I don't know, it's like a mission, I, I suppose, of mine to talk about this idea that culturally, right? Yeah. So we come from a puritanical culture. Like, let's just talk about the Western culture that we all live in. Um, that is what we're taught love should look like, right? right? We are taught that love should look, feel, smell, sound like codependency. And if it doesn't, it's not love, yeah. right? And so I talk a lot about how let's get out of this idea of like, oh, I'm a codependent only because I'm in a relationship with an alcoholic. It's no, we're all codependent. 
It's just how does it manifest for you as behaviors and relationships, okay? And so I'm glad that you said that because I think we need to normalize that conversation more, you know, whether it's because you come from a more, you know, religious background or not. So many of us are taught that if I choose myself, I am, I am selfish, right? And, and that goes to our children, right? I mean, this isn't just in our romantic right. relationships. It's in our friendships, it's in work, like you said, even saying no to a job. And so what do we have? We have a, a society of people who are running around doing things and carrying resentment, right? Carrying this idea of like, they don't know who they are, right? Because their whole purpose has been to serve others. So it, I could talk for hours on this. So thank you for bringing it up. But I just, I'm glad that you, you said it so we yeah. can normalize it. Danae, what's your definition of being chosen? <laughs> can you stand up please can we get her a microphone there's only like 30 people in here being chosen um, you know I think I love what you were saying about this thing of um, I have to think about love to me now feels more in alignment with how do I serve versus um, you know like this idea of transactional love that I yeah. think so many of us are raised you know, I love what you said because I feel like it can really challenge that thing that I've been carrying for a while. But I think also, like, if I fill my cup first, mm -hmm. then I have a cup that is full and overflowing. So I actually have something to give to you. So that becomes the step. And I think most of us are conditioned not to think about not to be flipped. Um, and so chosen is just like really attempting to see me and allowing me to see them. I think that like two way street of like actually. And not the idea of you. Yeah. Yeah. Not the projection of you, like who I think you should be or who I who I imagine you could be, right? But I have to see me first, right? Like yeah. I have to fill that cup of like really allowing myself to be worthy. Like I think that that's what you were speaking to and that choosing yourself first makes it that I'm able to allow someone else to see me. Yeah. So uh, finding beauty in the contrast. Um, so Vanessa and I were very different, and um, the more differences I saw, the more I started to drift, right? And then, since she's an avoidant, I'm, I'm an anxious so with our attachment styles. We'll talk about that. Yeah, me drifting caused her to run the other way, right? And so it wasn't until I started to um, not only accept and embrace, but start to see beauty in. So I think that's the tipping point, right? Okay, we're different. And a lot of times when people are different, you just kind of realize, oh, they're not for me, and you go the other way. This time, I'm going to stay. This time, I'm going to be curious about our differences. Mm -hmm. And then this time, I'm going to see if I can find beauty in our differences instead of um, them being you know, hash marks of why we shouldn't be together. And it, and it wasn't until I had that conversation with myself and then with Vanessa that I started to appreciate um, her differences. And uh, that's, I think, when things started to get better or good. And that took like, you know, a, a, a solid year or so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think this idea of finding beauty in the contrast, I like to talk about how for me it's a daily practice. Like I think for yeah. John, it was something that he had to do in the beginning. And I think for me, it's something that, and I mean, I could probably pinpoint this, attach this to a lot of things. It might be attachment style, it might be defense mechanism, whatever it is. but. Um, usually for me, when there's a difference that feels glaring, even now, that's when I get this whole avoidant, like, well, clearly this isn't worth it. This isn't working. Time to leave. Like, fuck this guy. Fuck this relationship. Like, my, you know, even now, I mean, that's the talk track that starts to happen. And so, you know, and it could be us having a, an argument and that's what's going on in my mind. Um, even though I'm fully committed and I'm in this relationship, and, but that is the, that's that, that voice in your head that, that's there to protect you, right? And so for me, the seeing beauty and the differences, what that looks like is reminding myself that whether I want to believe it or not, I, I chose him for a reason. There was an unconscious, most likely unconscious reason that I chose him and there was a lot of work to be done and a lot of growth to be had. And so when I get irritated, you know, that he's the kind of guy that, well, he always says, like, I drive, um, build a bus while driving it, right? Which, like, 
literally makes me sweat just thinking about mm -hmm. um, as I like write lists upon lists that I need things to be organized. Um, you know, I have to step back and, and when I feel that irritation in that difference, I have to go, there's so much opportunity in, in this to learn and to grow and to see the beauty in that. Because if everybody was a control freak like me, nothing, no bus would ever get built. <laughs> you know what I mean? None of us would have a bus. So we'd all be sitting around in piles of directions. You know what I mean? Um, and so I think for him, it was almost like, we talk about the breakers. For him, it was a breaker to get past. And for me, with my more avoidance stuff, it's like a daily practice in this finding, the finding beauty. Thoughts on the finding beauty in the contrast, whether you're in a relationship now or you can think about um, when you were or your last relationship. Or even friendships. Yeah. I find this stuff comes up in Yeah, it's any too. relationship, actually. Yeah. Mm. Um, but you're realizing that a lot of things that feel like complements each other are like it's pretty pretty grounding. You like to do things, but um, you need someone to like kind of bring them out of you to be at a better form. Like you need me, and I want to do a million things. I have dreams that are full of my own. Um, so he really grounds me. Mm -hmm. um, those things that brought us together are things that are a little bit pulling us apart right now, which is me. Um, so we have been talking about our differences a lot lately, but we still come back to like the same. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's that again, it's that daily practice, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's the it's the noticing the activation. You know, for me, it's the noticing of the irritation or the annoyance or the, the feeling of like, well, my way is better. Like, why can't they just do it this way? You know, because clearly I know better. And, uh, and, and leaning into that and questioning that, like, is that really true, right? Or is that me kind of trying to close myself off from this person? Or what is that, you know? You got it. Yeah. Because this is the reason, so I might as well cut and bail, right? There's a chair here if you want to sit. We've been waiting for you. So. <laughs> we kept it up. Now we can start. <laughs> you know what motivated me was um, I try to bring things back to self as much as I can, and I thought to myself, because uh, if, if, I, if I try to find beauty in the contrast, um, it almost feels like a gift, like I'm doing it for her, mm -hmm. giving her points. Um, and I brought it back to me, and I thought, uh, how would that stretch me, right? If I actually, in an honest way, was able to see things that um, was different than my past or was different than um, what I'm used to seeing, if I'm able to see things through a new lens, how would that shape me? How would that make me um, evolve or grow? And that was really interesting to me. And so that, to me, um, was motivation mm -hmm. to, to do it because I knew that if I can do it, um, and you know, like she says, it's daily, right? Some days I struggle with it, some days I don't, but. Um, it's going to make me a better person, and so um, that was that was kind of what what motivated me to to practice that. Yeah, that feels a lot there. like the choosing, right? It's like the filling up of the cup. Yeah. Right? Can I bring it back to myself? And if I bring it back to myself, then I'm able to to bring it to give it outward. Right. More. So um, attachment styles. She's a, uh, she's okay. avoidant. I'm anxious. Uh, love languages. Uh, I'm words of affirmation, and. Um, and touch. She's acts of service, <laughs> I thought right? You were struggling for a second. I was like, <laughs> um, she's vegetarian. I'm I eat meat. Um, she's so yoga. I'm more CrossFit. What else? You build the bus while driving it. Yeah, you're I, very organized. I, I was a producer for ten years in advertising, so like right. when I say I like lists and organizing, I right. made a career on it. <laughs> so now, um, if she finds something funny that I don't, instead of dismissing that or thinking that we're not meant to be or that we're different, I try to get. I try to be happy that she finds something funny, and find the amusement in her finding something funny instead of me um, trying to trace that or compare it to what I find funny. Does that right, make like, sense? Like feeling like I need to also find this funny rather than that. It's like appreciate Just be happy for that her. I'm happy. Yeah. yeah. Like and so that. that's been yeah. really, really helpful. I like that. Um, 
Speaking of attachment styles, um, can we share this one story just because I think it's so good with the earring? The earrings. Yeah. Story. And what then after that, maybe we'll go to a song. Um, so I, I've told this story a couple times. And when, I, when we were writing the book, um, I, I was a, there were a few people that were like, you need to put this in the book because it's a really good story. So. Um, Wait, let, let's first say what love languages are for people that, lo that don't know. Doing yeah. Um, so a lot of you know this, right? Love language is kind of like pop psychology at this point. Gary Chapman wrote this book forever ago. You know, he was a Christian counselor, marriage counselor. Um, and he just found, obviously, like we usually do, patterns of people coming in and talking about the same issues over and over again. So um, love languages is not something that's actually like, um, you know, backed by research. It's really just his own. But the thing is, exploded for a reason, because obviously we can relate to it. Yeah, it's how you give and receive love. Right. right? And the, the way that I like to look at it, too, is also I like to talk about it with my clients as like it's the cliff notes of needs, of expressing needs. Because again, so many of us are not taught how to express our needs because we're raised in this very codependent society, right? And so for me, especially when I first read love languages and I, I started understanding what they were, I was so struck by how quote unquote simple it was to just say like, I need this from you in order to feel loved. And it was like a very aha moment, right? So while they're very simple, I still to this day tell clients like if they haven't, there's a quiz online. The book is like super easy to read, like get familiar with it. Because even if you think the idea of love languages is cheesy, it is like the cliff notes for needs, right? And then it can go deeper from there, but it's almost like a jumping off point. So for those of you who don't know, I'll just do a super quick um, thing real quick. Let me tell you, so 116, um, we like simplified them in the book. So words of affirmation, right? So that's specific words of encouragement, empathy, love, and acknowledgement. Quality time, we know what that means. Present and connected time spent together, right? That's important. Physical touch, obviously hugs, you know, small of the back, sitting on lap, any kind of intimate touch. Acts of service, doing something for the other, whether or not they've asked for it. Um, and it can be a gesture or it can be something that you notice as part of their daily routine, right? Like taking over making dinner one night, for example. And then receiving gifts, right? So gift giving, small, large, whatever. Um, but it makes that person believe that they are cherished and known. Now, the interesting thing about these um, is that you can have a primary and a secondary. A lot of us do have two that kind of rival each other. And the way that you give is not always the same as the way that you receive, right? Um, and so that's why I think it's really important to, to, to really roll around in this and understand it, because I think it could be a very helpful jumping off point for needs conversations. So Vanessa's um, love language, one of the big ones is acts of service, right? It's not mine. And one day uh, she was getting ready and she lost her earring yeah. in the sink. So I was back to back with clients and I had no time in between. And I was getting ready and I was running around like a chicken with my head cut off and I dropped my earring down the sink. And I remember in that moment being the, the swearer that I am, basically stopping up and down being like, ah, 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 and him coming up and being like, oh my God, is everything okay? And me being like, it's fine. I fucking have it. And I'm freaking out, right? Pissed off five minutes ago. So I just put a towel over the sink and I said, just leave it. When I've got time, I'll take the sink apart because it was like, you know, down in there. I'll figure it out. And so I rushed off and I, I got in my sessions. So at some point between, I don't know, I think I had three sessions back to back, I came back down to the bathroom and the earring was sitting on the counter. And not only had John gotten the earring out, but in order to do that, he'd actually had to go to the hardware store, get the specific kind of wrench that was required to take the, the S curve. Not only did he do that, he actually cleaned it all up and put it all back together. <laughs> and then it was sitting there and, and it was, it was shot. I mean, I, I was floored. It was the dumbest thing. And yet it was like, I felt so loved in that moment um, because there had been so much planning that had gone into it. Um, I didn't have to tell him what to do. I didn't have to say, this is the kind of wrench you need. I mean, I didn't have to do any of this. And then he cleaned it up too. Uh, I know. And, and for people who are not acts of service, this is like the silliest story, but no, if you were an acts of service story. person, this is like the most like, he always says, I could write your name in the sky. And the first thing you would say is how much did that cost? <laughs> and yet you get my earring out of the sink in the way that he did. And I was like, oh my God, like, let's have sex right now. You know yeah. what I mean? like, which, which by like, the so way, much. which by the way, uh, she didn't say, I did so not. I didn't get anything. <laughs> Um, I wasn't doing it for points. I was doing it because I just thought, okay, it's like doing the dishes. She lost her earring. Let me see what I could do. 
Uh, and then, you know, I kind of challenge myself as because I'm really bad with tools. I don't know how to build anything like that. Sure. And so um, for the first time in my life, like I just put on my little Mr. Miyagi hat and went and started playing with the plumbing <laughs> and I happened to find it. It was no big deal. I didn't think it meant anything and just put it on the thing and went about my day. Um, the thing is, she didn't tell me what it meant to her. So I'm I heard this person. later from like. I'm, I'm not a words of affirmation person. But see, but this is the thing. <laughs> so this is where the rub comes into play, right? Here I am floating on cloud nine because he had done this access service thing. He has no idea that he just did this thing. So I got no credit. And I don't tell him Zero that credit this. that I did this. I don't even know that, that she, she liked it. It was just I like, oh, cool. I told all my friends that he did this thing for right. me. But I never actually told him until a while later. And that was really, it was a moment for us where we realized, oh, this is how love languages can actually really be a rub for people, right? Because he had no idea, right? And it was so, it's so hard for me. It's such a, a, a vulnerable thing for me to look somebody in the face and say, I appreciate you. That made me feel so amazing. Thank you. Like, I have a really hard time with words. So that comes really easy for me. And like, I do it too to much. I could look her in the eye and say, you know, you're sexy, you're amazing, yeah. and, you know, whatever. I feel like I, you know, whatever, a kid that lost something and found it, and what are you, on and on. Um, but that, that's not how she's wired, you know? Yeah. And so what I needed was her to tell me that that mattered and that that is how she um, receives love. And then I could say, oh, that's how she is. Now I'll make an effort to do more of that. But because she didn't say that, I probably wouldn't do it again. Yeah. It was a missed opportunity. Sure, yeah. sure. But um, we share that story because it's just a great example how um, something in the mundane, the day-to-day, -day, like a lost earring and someone finding it, um, it, it matters. It's a big deal when it comes to love and relationships. And I have to say this, and I say this to all of my clients, I'm very candid about how hard words of affirmation are for me, and I'm also very aware that it is how he feels loved. I'm not kidding. I can show you my phone. I actually have a reminder set in my phone every five oh. days that goes off that says, that just says John words. I now, know that, that might That's sound... Amazing not romantic <laughs> fine it can sound however it wants to sound but it is not something that comes naturally to me and it is important that he hear it and so whatever i need to do in my relationship to make sure that he feels loved even if it's some stupid thing on my phone i'm gonna do it so it's this is what we're talking about like relationships being work it feels really fucking stupid y'all to admit to you that i have something on my phone that says john words that goes off every three days but like this is the work that it takes you know and I feel stupid every time I do it, and I still do it because it's important, you know. Oh, yeah, I didn't know that. That's really sweet. My my reminder says no. <laughs> I, I, mean it. I mean it. I should. I never tell him these things. Yeah, I don't. Again, yeah, I don't know. Uh, my reminder says, John, take care of yourself. <laughs> take care of yourself. It's Friday night. I know you're lonely. Take care of yourself. In some of your primary relationships, I'm sure you're very aware of like which way you tend to lean when you're activated, right? So really, what does it mean? It just means when your attachment wounding is activated, how, how do you respond, right? Do you respond in the more anxious way or the more avoidant way? And then obviously the spectrum in between. That's like my, my 20 second version of like years and years of research, right? To tell you what attachment styles are. So John, at least in our relationship, John tends to show up more uh, anxious, anxious right? and I tend to show up more avoidant. And again, like we were talking about with the, the differences and beauty and the contrast, there's a reason why that term uh, opposites attract exists, right? The things that we love also activate the shit out of our, us, right? And it's the reason why we always find ourselves in these relationships, people that are very different than us, um, because they do activate us. And I mean, I believe it's as an opportunity to grow, right? Um, and so I can't even count the number of clients that I've worked with where it's the dynamic of the anxious and the avoidant together, right? It's so common. Very rarely you're gonna have an avoidant and avoid it because then you just wouldn't have a relationship, right? <laughs> that would be very simple. Sometimes you'll have an anxious and an anxious, right? But a lot of times you get this very anxious avoidant dance. Um, the push-pull, the distance or pursuer, depends on how you yeah. kind of hear it talked about, right? And there's more attachment styles, but we're just giving you the broad strokes of, yeah. of, of these two, and everyone's kind of swimming towards secure attachment. Uh-huh, right. Questions about attachment styles or? We can also get it. Well, we'll get into shares. how it shows up for us. But. Yeah, yeah. Um, share is good. Are there only two types of attachment styles? No, there's more. So it's a spectrum. Yeah. Um, if you go into the research, I mean, I think now there's they're showing like nine or 14. Do you remember the last? I don't even remember the last count. I mean, they just keep, you know, there's like insecure, avoidant. There's and, and it's like variations of how those show up. 
I'm not an attachment like guru by any means, um, but there's a lot of research out there. That one book that everybody loves, Attached, it's like the kind of 101. It is just that, it's a 101. It's a really helpful understanding, but it is very binary, avoidant, anxious. There's other research out there that goes into it more in depth. It's fascinating, right? Here's the thing about attachment, um, and Danae and I talk about this a lot, but Gabor Mate talks about how, as babies, right? First of all, we all know that we need to attach to survive, okay? So it's not to blame the parent necessarily for the way that we develop our attachment style, but we as beings are put here, we know very early on, I have to attach to my caregiver in order to survive, right? Gabor Mate talks about how every person, there's this, there's this um, we're torn between attachment and autonomy, right, or authenticity. But the thing is, is that because attachment is primal to survival, we're gonna, choose we're gonna choose attachment every time. So if it comes down to my attachment wound being activated, I might be left, I might be abandoned, I might be rejected. If that feeling is going on, obviously under the surface for most of us, right? I'm gonna choose attachment over authenticity because that means survival, right? Now it doesn't at this age anymore but it does really at a primal level mean survival. And so I always talk about that just to really normalize, like there's nothing wrong with you because you respond in these ways. I mean, we're talking very primal responses to being triggered to feel like you're gonna be abandoned, right? Um, but obviously they can show up in very unhealthy ways and dynamics, right? Especially when we get into relationships with people who have that opposite way of responding. Um, I shared a little bit about how in my head, I start to do this thing where I get that very like, fuck him, fuck this, this isn't gonna work, I'm over this, right? That is my, usually my avoidant coming up, right? Anytime there's conflict, anytime there's conflict, that's the voice that turns on for me. Always has been, way before John, this predates John, right? But I'm in a very different situation now. I'm aware of it, I know that that voice is there, I know that voice is not really my voice, but it's one voice that I have that's there to protect me. I have created and crafted a toolkit very specifically um, to me and what my needs are in those moments of activation to help me kind of balance myself out. I talk to clients about how it's really important that we all figure out what those very specific tools are for each of us. So I share this because I, I have found it to be helpful. So my tools tend to be, John and I are in conflict, John comes to me with something that he wants to talk about. My immediate response is, I am bad, versus like, oh, we gotta talk about this thing. Hey, you did this thing to hurt my feelings. I go to a place of, I am bad, I am bad, I am bad. I wanna bail out of that feeling of shame, cut and run, fuck this, obviously this isn't the right person, right? It's a very typical cycle. So what do I do? I tend to get into that voice. I tend to almost like dissociate. Like, I'm not here anymore. I'm like out of my body, I'm up here. So I have learned that I need to stay in my body, so what do I do? I will find myself like pinching my legs, digging my fingers into whatever I'm sitting on so that I am fully aware that I'm in my body. And then I will actually repeat a mantra, which I've stolen from John, actually, which is try to understand before being understood. Try to understand before being understood. Try, and I'm literally repeating this mantra as I'm looking at him and having a conversation with him. This is not gonna work for everybody, but if you're somebody like me who's more avoidant and you tend to leave your body, those kind of tools can be really helpful. And I, I give this kind of you know, inner looking into myself to say, figure out what those are for you and then practice them. If one doesn't work, fine, toss it out, try a new one, right? Until you know what those tools are for you so that when your attachment style is activated, you can attempt to bring yourself down to a base level so that your rational mind comes back online and you're not just functioning from that like reptilian brain that's like cut and run, you know? Or anxious. It's attack. interesting when I, um, so if I sit her down and say, hey, we need to have a conversation, uh, she, she like morphs into this 16-year-old um, girl that uh, is, um, thinks that she's in trouble. Um, Even in body language. In the energy and body language, it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think we all do a version of that, you know, mm -hmm. and it all stems from our story. Um, so me being an anxious type, if I'm not feeling desired, if I'm not, um, you know, uh, cuddled and given attention and, and all of these things, um, I then cut or I think um, this isn't working or I jump to conclusions when none of that is true. It's just the stuff that's going on in my head. So the work simply is to 
be aware of your attachment style, and then when that anxiety comes up, see if you can um, manage it and reparent it and work with it by yourself, you know, mm -hmm. or even you know, with a therapist, but um, not put it on your partner and see if you can sit with it and, and grow through it, you know, yeah. and try to swim more toward a secure. And yeah, I'll commend you though, because yes, it's 100% ours to manage. And the more you know about your partner, you know, or friends, I've seen attachment styles get activated in my friendships for sure. The more you understand about your partner and where they're coming from, you can also show up in a way that's obviously supportive, right? So for example, John, knowing that I tend to go to that avoidant space, in the beginning of our relationship, it became very clear that I do this thing, you come to me, you say you have feedback, and I go to this place of defense, clearly I'm a bad person. That's where I go to it. And he had this beautiful way in the beginning of doing this thing where it was like, simultaneously saying, this is important, we need to talk about this, and not like actually doing this, but almost like energetically like over my back and being like, you're not a bad person, like this is just what we do in relationships, we have conversations, this is what it looks like, you know? And it was, a, I'd never had that before. Usually my way of being like this would then activate them and then it would turn into this huge blow up cycle, right? I never had somebody who actually would say, hey, I'm here, I got, you know, let's do this together. And so, yes, it's ours to own, but also I think there is our ways that you can be supportive if you don't take it personally, because it's not about you. <laughs> it's not, it has nothing to do with him, right? You know what, um, and, and we'll get to kind of new love and we'll, and we'll wrap this up, but um, for me, I think giving your body the experience of something new and different, so it's not in your head, it's um, giving, your giving your body the experience of a new and different type of love that then eclipses the old. And I think if you do a lot of that, you're reconditioning your body. And I think if you don't do that, we're always going to subconsciously um, pull from the old. We're going to snap back. We're going to overthink. We're going to do all the patterns that um, destroy relationships, right? And so you can't by yourself give yourself that experience. You actually have to ask for it. And I think this is where relationships are really powerful because I could sit in a room and I could just like visualize what something feels like. Um, but if I ask for it and she gives me the experience that is new and different and I sit with it and we talk about it, um, then the relationship becomes the container that is going to grow both of us, right? Yeah. The relationship becomes greater than its parts. Yeah. I think the beauty about relationships is if you are building something healthy and sustainable with your partner, the relationship can carry, can carry and, and evolve and grow you guys. And I think that's, um, I think it's one of the wonders of just being human, you know? Uh, and it's sad to me that re when relationships are toxic that we lose that. And I will say for those of you who aren't in romantic partnerships, this kind of stuff you can practice in any relationship. Yeah, with your mom, really right, friendships. You know, I'll say, yeah. I'll, I'm gonna call her out, but I, I use this example because it was so profound, and John and I talked about this, but I had an experience not that long ago, maybe a month ago, um, Danae and I do a lot of work together too as friends and, and coworkers and there was some stuff that I had been feeling that I wanted to talk her about and be, me being me I was like it's no big deal it's no big deal until suddenly it was like consuming me and I could not talk about it that's what I do and so I was talking to her about it and then I was crying and then I felt stupid that I was crying right I'm sure all of you know this cycle and I will never forget Danae saying to me you know you're still going to be my best friend even if you don't want to do this thing right like even if we don't do this project together like you know that you're still my best friend right and again it was like those moments i've had with him where i was like i would never experienced that before even in a friendship right but those kind of healing moments that's how we rewire that's how these attachment styles that's how this stuff starts to really um work itself out for lack of a better term, right? Like starting to find that middle ground of being like, oh, this is what that feels like. This is what secure feels like. This is what vulnerability and intimacy in a safe container feels like, right? And now that I feel it, now I know what to look for. Now I know what I need to do to get it and what I need to expect from my relationships to also get it, right? Maybe expect isn't the right word, but maybe ask for, right? Um, and so I share that example also to say, for those of you who aren't partnered romantically, it doesn't matter. You can still be practicing this stuff even in your relationships, and you should be, actually, you know? 
How many people are single in here? Oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, well, most of you guys. Exactly. Um, it's not just work for a couple. Of yeah, and I was thinking, you know, as you um, think about who you want to invest in next, I, I would recommend not thinking and uh, asking yourself how you want that space to make you feel. Yes. And a lot of times, uh, because we have types and we put weight on, you know, aesthetics and all that, um, if you know how you want the, the relationship and the person to make you feel, um, when you're around that feeling, using that as the radar, you're going to attract something more that's going to be in alignment with what you want instead of thinking like, oh, blue eyes Checklist. and, you know, yeah, abs and, you know, whatever, right? So how do I want that next thing to make me feel? How is it going to be different than the previous? What kind of love experience do I want for myself? How, what's the feeling? And then allow that to be the radar. Allow that to be your compass. And when you're at a party or you're engaging with someone or you're swiping or however you're meeting people, oh wait, this, is, this person or this space is giving me that feeling, then that's the green light. That's a good sign. Um, to me, I trust that more than my eyes. Or your yeah. head. Or my head, because <laughs> yeah. Because um, we overthink and we analyze way too much. Well, that was in the beginning of our relationship, right? You're yeah. like, how do you know? I'm like, I don't know, actually. I just feel right now in this moment that it feels okay and it feels like what I want it to feel like. And he really struggled with that because he wanted to know. I want to know that this is the right one. And he was up here and I was like, I don't know that it's the, I don't know that you're the right one. I just know that right now in this moment, I like being with you and I like the way this is feeling. This, this may be a little, little TMI, but it's in the book, so I guess whatever. But um, <laughs> there's a chapter called Reiki Hands. And um, when we were being intimate, I felt something, and we weren't like having sex or anything, but we were being intimate and I felt um, an energy from her touch that I had never before felt. And I was ca very curious about that. And that actually became kind of the, um, the dangling carrot for me, investigating, oh, there's a new feeling. I wonder what, what that's about. Um, yeah, and I called it Reiki hands. But, uh, but again, that's not thought. It's just um, feeling. It's new. It's different. It's curiosity. And then that can lead to um, new experiences and then eventually new definitions. We wanted to end with uh, the new definition of love, right? We all hopefully have a, a new definition, but we also have uh, stuff to give away. Um, Can you read that part? Yeah, I want to give away a, a few books real quick. Well, let's give it to people who shared too, for sure. This is your new love part, if you want to read that. Uh, new love. New love is about the belief, not the promise. So many want the promise. So many crave a contract. So many want a guarantee. But love is not property like it was in the 50s when life revolved around building the perfect picket fence, wearing dresses and press suits, having 2.5 kids and walking on eggshells. Love is a space and in that space a belief is born. The action of love is wrapped around that belief like arms and that action, assuming it's healthy, protects the space where that belief continues to grow. You will create the space to believe if you focus more on the belief, the expansion, the possibilities, the greater that comes from two whole people and the glue and growth of today, not tomorrow, and less on the deal, the agreement, and all the what ifs. If you love with instead of at or around, if you stay engaged in the here and now, instead of, if you stay engaged in the here and now, lock eyes and hold faces, if you refuse to play chess and just be the most honest version of yourself, if you seek to be seen instead of wanted, if you fe feed and grow that space, the promise will be the fruit. Should I keep it? To love is to create the space to believe. Without it, love will bear no promise. Yeah. So um, what is your new definition of love on social? I've been asking. Um, people that and they've been giving me some videos um, and I kind of wanted to end with that and then maybe we'll end with a song but what, what's your new definition of love with um, what you've gone through where you've been and where you are now what is uh, your new definition of love Danae what is your new sorry I, I don't, <laughs> there's no hands you know <laughs> um, 
Ooh, freedom. Yes. Okay. Oh, I love that. Millie, what's your new definition of love? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Your definition of love. Going by what you're feeling is the definition of love. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, nice. Okay. Your definition of love. Um, I guess like loving myself first. Mm. The things that I love about myself, I'll put that energy out and I'll come back. Yeah. 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 I love that you have a tattoo that, that um, is a good reminder for love you. Yourself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> New definition of love. Right. Yes. Yeah, it's huge. Thank you. Lee, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, I love that. It's a it's its own living breathing thing. Yes. It's not a constant. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, we're going to give away some books and also um you know, I, we have this thing called the lab with their live Zoom classes and um if you're here just give me your email and we'll give you all the links for free for a month. Um, Danae teaches in there, Vanessa teaches codependency, M Millie does astrology, um, there's trauma, there's lots of great uh, Zoom classes. So uh, leave your email and we'll give you that free for a month. And uh, we'll give away some books. Um, questions about anything or anything that you guys want to share? So we just have, you know, yeah. Um, I recently discovered that I'm anxious attachment like you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there, I guess, how can I start to feel more safe so that I don't need to feel chosen? Mm. I'm going to have an idea, but you want to start? Yeah, go ahead. You know, this isn't, I mean, it, it's not an overnight thing, right? Clearly, there's there's a lot of work that goes into that. But it's it's going to be a lot of these almost simple sounding things that we keep talking about, right? Which is like cultivating that ability to be aware of the activation when it's happening, right? It's in that cultivation of that awareness that you're gonna be able to build in that pause that you need to investigate and go deeper rather than reacting out of the activation of actually slowing down and saying, I'm activated, what's going on, okay? So that takes time because you gotta really start to be like, uh-oh, I feel that happening, what's that, you know? And, and taking care of yourself. Hey, I, I need a minute. I need to excuse myself from this situation because I have to go maybe self-soothe for a minute before I react in a way that I actually don't want to react, right? And so you start to cultivate that practice of being able to separate, self-soothe a little bit, ask yourself, what's happening? What's that dialogue that's going on? Question it, get in a dialogue with yourself, truly. Talk to yourself, it's okay, no one's judging you. <laughs> you know, where is that coming from? Whose voice is that? You know, who's telling me that if I'm not chosen in this specific way all the time, that I'm not worthy? Where is that coming from? Who told me that? Where did I get that message? It's a lot of self-inquiry, right? And it's through that you build a muscle. You truly build a muscle to be able to 
get to that place quicker, that place of self-soothing quicker, that ability to, to like take a breath and be like, okay, I actually need a minute. I'm gonna go take 15 minutes. I'm gonna go take a walk. I'm gonna go listen to some music. I'm gonna go journal, get to the bottom of this before I come back into this, you know, whatever the situation is. Um, but it's a lot of those kind of self-compassion practices and, and practices of self-inquiry. Have you been, um, what's the longest you've been alone, single? Single. Yeah, the longest in your life. What stretch of your life have you been um, alone the longest, single? Yeah, and how long, how long? Um, in the last two years. Yeah, so I went, um, after my divorce, I was single for about four years, and I needed to be with myself in those four years to choose myself, to get comfortable with myself. I sat in diners by myself. I worked out by my, I did a lot of things by myself, rode my motorcycle. Um, I got to know me. So when I um, found someone else to invest in, what I was bringing to the table was not dependency, um, but my own ability to give myself what I need. Yeah. Uh, and you have to decide what is a real need that I really need from someone, yeah. and, and what is something that I should be responsible for. Before, everything was on my partner. I needed this, I needed sex, I needed this, you know, and if they didn't give it to me, then it was wrong. Um, today, there's a speed bump where I think about, okay, is that really something I need, or can I give that to me? And I think it takes a while for us to build a relationship with ourselves where we can give ourselves that, you know? And what I hear and what you're saying is also through that experience and that time and those experiences that you gave yourself, what you, it sounds like what you learned was, I am here no matter what. Regardless of anybody else, regardless of getting needs, not getting needs, being chosen, not, I am always here with myself and I'm not going anywhere. It, Once you know that, that's when those attachment, regardless of which side kind of on the spectrum you fall, that's when that starts to be like, oh, okay, I see what this is. You don't get kind of sucked into it as much when you really do, like John, it just sounded like you just so beautifully summed it up. It's like, oh no, I know that I'm here and I choose me. Let me give you an example. So when I was married, um, I was married to uh, an actress and she was on a movie set and they had a rap party and she was going into um, a party that was um, thrown by a dude in his hotel room and there was a few people. And what I needed was reassurance that she was going to um, be faithful, right? Which she was, I was jealous and young. And so I flipped it and said, oh, a good wife wouldn't do that. You wouldn't put yourself in a situation where you're in uh, uh, someone's room, right? That's not whatever, right? That's all. Um, that was my tactic, right? If Vanessa goes out with her friends, whether she's in a, a guy's room or not, um, I don't need her to text me 20 times for that anymore, right? That's not. That's something that if I'm having feelings about it, that's my own thing that I can self sue. I mean, I'm going to change the locks, of course, but. Um, <laughs> Well, I don't need that. I don't need that from her. I don't need reassurance, right? But also, you might have a conversation with me. Like, if you really do, I mean, there is a healthy way to say, ooh, man, I just, I don't know. I know you wouldn't, but sure. I'm comfortable with this. Sure, sure. Right? If I knew that there was uh, something that, that made me feel uncomfortable, and that's what you have to decipher, then I would say, hey, yeah. listen, here's a piece I'm struggling with. I actually am kind of jealous here. What do you think about it? So you bring yeah. it to the table in kind it's of a neutral. It's me and my jealousy. It's not you and the things that you're doing, right. which is the difference that yeah. nuance. But I'm using that example because I remember after the fact, looking back, and I stripped that moment from her. Mm. So the rap party, the graduation, the celebration, I took that from her by saying, you're being a bad wife, get home. That was my need. And so I took that from her, do you mm. know what I'm saying? And a lot of taking from someone and then they, they uh, they're going to divorce you on, on over Skype. <laughs> anyway, I needed that to happen, but um, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think through communicating where you're at uh, and then uh, practicing um, 
choosing to trust, knowing that it could, you know, hurt you. Um, trust is also earned, you know? Expectations are really lethal for any relationship. You're setting yourself up for hurt, right? Whether I- to protect yourself. Right, and we get where they come from, right. and they're still lethal, right? Both can be true. And so here's the thing, whether I, if we're in a relationship, whether I trust you or not, you are your own person and you're gonna do what you wanna do. Whether I'm looking through your phone or not, whether I'm berating you and asking you who you've been with or not, whether I'm right. So expectations, especially when it comes to being faithful, a lot of times that's only hurting you in a relationship, right? Now, I'm not saying, we're, I mean, look, this is a bigger, bigger conversation. If we're talking couples yeah. that come in and there's infidelity, I mean, there's lots to unpack here. But if I'm just talking broad strokes, we have to really understand that that I'm defending myself and we get it. I know where it comes from, but that I'm defending myself, I'm protecting myself in that scenario is actually usually only hurting you more than it's helping you, right? Because any expectation is gonna set you up for failure. Even if I expect my partner to be perfect and never do anything that makes me mad or uncomfortable, clearly I'm setting myself up for failure, right? Um, and so I, I, I'm very cautious of examining people's expectations of their partner. Um, because even if somebody says, I screwed up, I wanna try over again, they're gonna screw up again. Might not look the same way, but of course they're gonna fuck up. They're human, just like you're gonna fuck up because you're human. And I think trust yeah. is like forgiveness where it's a, a, choice. You, a choice. It starts it's with a choice, but then yeah. you gotta give yourself, you gotta give your body the experience that the sky didn't fall when you chose this. Oh, it's safe. Yeah. The stove is not on, not hot anymore. And the more that you kind of convince your body of that, then you trust that person or that relationship or whatever, or yourself, I think. So yeah, I think it takes time. All right, let's skip some books away. Uh, the other day, uh, Vanessa and I were, um, were um, doing our, our book club, and uh, I said uh, we finished each other's sandwiches on, on accident. <laughs> what movie, and I didn't even know about that. I meant, um, it's because we have a it was toddler. A, it was a slip. Yeah, it was a slip. What, what movie is that from? Oh, okay. One, two, <laughs> two, three, four. three, four. All right, great. I got four books for <laughs> I you. Called him out on that, so I was like, I can't believe you're such a dad now. <laughs> oh, you gave him the kid books. <laughs> yeah, well, because it's uh, here. I don't know. There's two people. Yeah. Um, these are galleys, so they're not for sale, but we um, got them from our publisher early. So, uh, how do you want to give some of these away? I was going to give people who were sharing and being vulnerable. Oh, uh, do we have enough? Is that how you want to do it? You wanna? You didn't tell me that you wanted to do trivia, so I'm gonna leave that uh, to you. Well, if so you many, wanna do trivia, it's on you. <laughs> so, many people, so many people shared that I don't know if we have enough copies. Let's, let's, uh, let's, let's think of something. Give, give, um, give a question, any trivia? I am so not about... good on the spot. I'm like, I have no idea. God. I'm putting you on the spot. Oh, how long did it take you to get here? Ooh, that's great. Is yours far? Yeah, you, you came from no. far, didn't you? No, he came from the valley. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that could be far. I came from Redondo. Like, how long? Redondo with 15 hours? You came no. from Oregon? No way. You did? Here's the whole oh my stack. God. Did you get all of them? <laughs> God, I feel really, I feel bad. Man, thank God this is free. We don't give money backs or returns. Or, um, where, wait, you said, uh, where? Redondo. Don't know that's Which is what? Oh, oh Anaheim. Anaheim's, Anaheim's far. So was that two hours? Uh, hour and 15. Oh, that's legit. Who, who's, who's over an hour? Not like LA traffic took me over an hour, but like Here you go. legit hour. over an hour. You're, you guys are all getting books because you bought one, obviously. <laughs> These are just kind of like collector books. What else? I was going to give her a one, two. Here's a, here's a random question. How, how old is our little one? For those who follow us. Mm -hmm. Two. two and what? Two and what? <laughs> That's very specific. I don't even know if you know that. Yeah, I don't even know that. You said two. One of you guys said two. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, thank you guys for coming. Um, Donald's going to lead us out with a little tune. And uh, what else? That's it. Yeah. Appreciate you all. Yeah, this is our first live kind of event before we go on our um, book tour. The book comes out in September. We're guinea pigging you all because yeah. uh, this is before like the PR and all the fun things start. Yeah. So we wanted to get 
an intimate group together and do this chat first yeah. live. And after the song, we could hang out. If you guys want us to sign um, the book or anything, let Picture us know. Whatever. Yeah, we'll hang out. Cool. Cool. You are my love. You are my heart. And we will never, ever, ever be apart. Are we and I? Hey, also, um, Ferris is going to give you a free drop-in. If you live close, you could uh, take any of their, their many classes here. Cool. We love this place. We're yeah. here. We love this place. <laughs> <laughs> we almost died together last week, actually. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all. <laughs>